Hi, I'm Steve Benziger, and I'm the small grains breeder at the University of Nebraska. And I've released about 35 wheat cultivars, probably six barley, and I'm in the process of releasing my fifth or sixth triticale cultivar. I'm here, uh, the reason why I, I'm a plant breeder is because I wanted to feed the world. And uh, that's what motivates me, is making sure farmers can produce and people have grains to eat. Well, I've been a plant breeder since I got my PhD in 1975, so that's almost 40 years of work. And one of the things that just amazes me is most people don't, first of all, know much about plant breeding, but secondly, they have no idea how the field has changed. When I started out, uh, basically everything was done by making a cross. Once you made a cross, you took it to the field, and then you had to visually uh, characterize it. We did some biochemical assays, and some other assays such as uh, sort of just regular analytical types of things. Now we're using uh, high throughput genotyping. We are using very, very sophisticated statistics using state-of-the-art computers. Uh, everything we can to make our science more precise, more efficient, and better. Uh, we also are prepared for the future in that we think that climate change is occurring, and even if it's not, we always have heat stress, we always have drought stress, so we're using all the techniques, all the tools that we can to ferret out or to find lines that are do better under the periodic droughts and heat stresses that we have in the Great Plains. Well, uh, the two courses that I teach are both five-week, one-credit modules. The first one is the introduction to self-pollinated crop plant breeding. And as you can see, I'm in a greenhouse full of wheat. Uh, and wheat is a self-pollinated crop. So it's what I live, breathe every day is how to breed this crop. I also work on triticale, which is a modern crop used for biomass and forage, and barley, which is used mainly in our case for feed grains and forage. But of course, people do know barley is used for beer. So all three are self-pollinated crops. And then the second course I talk about are germplasm and genes, which is where do you get new variation? And then there we talk about things such as uh, using traditional crossing methods, using wild species and wild relatives, uh, using transgenic plants or transformation, genetically modified organisms. We talk about mutations. You know, anything that can create variation in the second course. In the first course, it's everything about how you, once you put variation in, how do you select and then eventually release new varieties. So those are sort of the thumbnail sketches of the two modules that I teach. The third module, we taught by Tom Hogemeyer, an equally experienced corn breeder who is uh, teaching the introduction to cross-pollinated crop uh, breeding. One of the other groups that really have begun to, to view this course as being a, a useful tool are teachers and people who need to communicate agriculture where they want to see really practical examples. You know, if you want to teach genetics, you can talk about Drosophila, you can talk about E. coli, you can talk about a lot of things. But when you talk about genetics that basically are the underpinning of what feeds the world, that adds a relevance that people can use. Behind me, you see all of the green wheat. These are all segregants for a insect resistance called Hessian fly. We're growing these plants because they went through our screens. We found out they were resistant. We threw away the susceptibles. It's a great way of understanding genetics. It's a great way of seeing how plants segregate, how Mendelian genetics, which is taught in every basic biology class from high school on, how it actually works and how it has a relationship to feeding the world. So it's, it's very, very relevant to people. So one of the questions I often get is, you know, why do you like teaching and why are you qualified to be a teaching? Well, to me, even though I've released over 45 different cultivars, my legacy will always be my students. 
They're the ones that will train the next generation, and that's the continuum. And, you know, plant breeding is all about a continuum. It takes me 12 years to create a new variety. With new technologies such as doubled haploidy, I can maybe cut it down to eight or nine. But I'm 63. I don't expect to work to 72. And so everything I'm doing right now is for the next generation, my successor. And I think as a teacher, you're always looking for that one student who you can light a spark who will really take the field beyond where you left it. Now, as for my qualifications, I have released, like I said, about 45 different cultivars. But I think also you need to bring in a different worldview. And so if you look at my career, I started out with the federal government, the USDA ARS, which is a wonderful group to work with. From there, I moved to uh, Monsanto. I worked there for three years, had some industry experience. And then for the last 28 years, I've been at the University of Nebraska. So I feel that I have experience working in the private sector. I have experience working in the government sector. I have experience working in academia. And then I sit on the board of trustees of the International Rice Research Institute, one of the great global research centers uh, trying to alleviate world poverty. And by doing that, I have an international exposure. Now, there's an old saying in Africa, which I learned while being on the Erie Board of Trustees, which is, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And so if you look at my program, you'll see that collaborations with other universities, with international centers, with companies, all are a key component of what we do. And so I think we can bring that kind of perspective of teamwork, of collaboration, of having an impact that is needed to train the next, you know, next generation of, of scientists. What I really like about the certificate program is I've never felt as an academic that one size fits all. You know, I'm passionate about distance education because I think it's important and we can reach students that can't come to the University of Nebraska. I also think that not every uh, educational item has to be a BS, an MS, or a PhD. A certificate program is outstanding because it allows students the flexibility to pick up some additional expertise where they need it in areas which are key to them without making a two-year commitment, a three-year commitment, a four-year commitment, and perhaps ending up with something that they really don't want. It's that flexibility and personal tailoring that makes the certificate program outstanding for professional development. The goal of my classes is really twofold. One is to provide the consistent foundation that everyone in the field should know. Now that's, that's the conventional knowledge. But then the other goal is to update it with what's really happening now, what's new, what's state of the art. So yes, I can teach you know, how we handle genetics, I can teach how we handle variation, but at the same time, uh, there's a revolution going on in agriculture where we're now being able to use transgenes or genetically modified organisms. People need to see how that's done, how that goes into the variation. So how do you take something which you've done for 50 years and update it? And I think that's a key component to this class, is that you know, a person that's maybe uh, was taught how to do plant breeding, say, 20 years ago, is unfamiliar with genomic selection, maybe unfamiliar with genetically modified crops. These types of questions we address. We try to keep it as current as possible, as relevant as possible, building on a foundation that would allow them to be a broad-spectrum plant breeder. So one of the things that I often get questions on is, is again, how does this fit students who want to come in to plant breeding? And uh, I really like the transitioning student. You know, this is a way, you know, I listened to National Public Radio and they talked about high tech jobs and they highlighted a cotton breeding facility, I think it was in Memphis, area, uh, Memphis uh, Tennessee, by one of the major seed companies. And it was uh, an outstanding tape. Everybody was making excellent. Uh, dollars doing high-tech, high-class research, 
And yet many of them came from areas like molecular genetics, but they didn't know how to do the breeding. And so this is an area where I think there's a huge need for plant breeders right now. Genetics is becoming more important. Our tools to do genetic understanding are becoming much, much better and more importantly, much less expensive, so they become more available to all. And we have these students who are skilled in an area, but never see the applications. And now they can come into a field. You know, if you look at the great seed companies, you know, the headquarters of the DuPonts, the Pioneers, the Monsantos, I guess I should say DuPont Pioneer, Monsanto, uh, Syngenta, Lima Grain, Bear Crop Science, all of these massive companies, and see what a seed business can build, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's probably one of the best kept secrets in agriculture. And so we like to allow students who can see an opportunity, a mechanism, a way to get into that uh, opportunity without having to fully commit to a master's or a PhD program. Now clearly the information we teach is suitable for master's and PhD students, but we also want to use this as a way to do uh, professional development and transitioning. Open that window, let the human mind be free, let it fly. So the question is, where do my courses fit? Historically, uh, they're taught as the first graduate level, uh, occasionally for high aptitude undergraduates, and for those with experience or wanting to gain experience in, the, in uh, plant breeding. So they're introductory courses at a relatively high level. Uh, they are the foundation to, for self-pollinated crop breeding. You should learn every common breeding method, the genetic theory behind it, and how that's changing. The second course on germplasm and genes is to teach you where we found variation, genetic variation, which is the driving force of plant breeding in the past and where we're going to find it in the future and how we're going to use new selection technologies to allow us to do it better. Breeders change for two things. One is novelty, something they couldn't do in the past. That's transgenic research and efficiency, and that's the high throughput genotyping, high throughput phenotyping, uh, much better computer skills, bioinformatics, these types of things. All of those topics are sort of covered in our course. Now, having that as your foundation, that then allows you to go much more in depth into specific areas that you want to look at. So if you were interested in, say, breeding for corn rootworm resistance, or if you're interested in breeding for end use quality, or trying to make wheat that is not uh, as gluten, uh, doesn't have as much gluten for the gluten intolerant people, these types of questions all can be addressed by this course as, as to how, do you, how would you approach these things. Again, what I also like is we're very much the applied genetics. Most people, when they think about genetics, they think of uh, an F2 ratio, maybe a back cross or a test cross ratio. We're working in the later generations, so we add the, the full depth of what genetics at different generations can do. And we'll teach students how to, how to work that. And that's exactly what happens when you're bringing products to market. You know, one of the things that just always amazes me is the technology of plant breeding. So here we are, we're in my greenhouse, and I've been in this greenhouse for 28 years. And what are the changes we're seeing? Well, we've gone to automatic watering so that we can go to smaller pots. We can water three times a day with no extra labor. We've gone to CFL lights so that we've really cut our energy costs down. We have, of course, all of our fans coming on whenever the temperature gets too hot or, or turning off whenever it gets too cold. All of our heating, cooling is all completely regulated. In the greenhouses we'll be in in the future, we're going to have shade cloths come across anytime the sun gets too bright or too hot, again, for energy savings. But it, it just gives you an idea of how high-tech plant breedings become. All of our combines now weigh the grain we harvest right on the fly. Uh, we do that for two reasons. One is just for the, uh, it's, it's quick, it's convenient. We can get so many more plots harvested. It also trains our students in the way they will work in industry or other uh, public or private plant breeding programs. They're going to be using state-of-the-art combines. We have to have state-of-the-art combines. Every one of our tractors, every one of our drills uses global positioning satellites 
so that everything is dropped at the exact spot. We actually have the GPS coordinates for every plot we plant, and we're looking at well over 20,000 plots. And then that can all be tied into our databases. It can all be visualized using soil maps, using our fertility regimes. So the amount of information we're generating is, is just extraordinary. In our high throughput phenotyping, we did 53 million data points in our first season. You know, so people used to think about uh, plant breeding as being sort of, you know, you kick the dirt and you walk on. What we're able to do now is just absolutely extraordinary. You know, we generally get uh, 10,000 data points or more per line when we do our genomic selection. Uh, so we're looking at, again, you know, millions and millions and millions of data points, the computer power to do that, growing plants so that we don't have the labor intensity that we used to have makes us much more efficient and much more dependable. You know, it, it's hard to keep a plant watered in a greenhouse where you may be able to hear a little bit of the fans where it's hot outside and you have to give them continuous watering virtually to make sure they never dry out. All of that's automated and efficient and that's frankly the way private sector is doing it, the public sector, if we're going to educate students that may go into the private sector need to do it. And I think that's kind of the state-of-the-art technology has just made plant breeding actually one of the highest tech scientists that you can have and one of the highest tech integrative scientists, sciences that you can have. That's what makes plant breeding fun.